I mean, I, I'm not surprised by what happened, but what okay. is different is the global reaction to it. You know, so it's hopeful, and it also it comes at a particular time in our shared history as a human society, a time of difficulty, and people begin to see that it's not just a question of race. That is a far bigger question. What do you mean by the fact that the global reaction was was perhaps different? My personal reaction to seeing the murder in broad daylight of a man with a police officer in full view of bystanders who were trying to intervene, murdering a man. My first initial re- and my first reaction, like anybody else's, was total revulsion, disgust, mm-hmm. outrage, and sadness. And then my second thought was that actually. This is not unusual. Why am I outraged? This has been happening for a very long time. And also the consequences for the perpetrators of this kind of injustice, zero. I mean, I cannot think of any successful prosecution in recent times of anybody that has murdered wantonly a black American, or indeed in the United Kingdom. It's not just like this happens in the United States, it happens here also. Then I realized that Despite the public trying to intervene as George Floyd was being murdered, they were being prevented. And I think any normal human instinct is to prevent harm to fellow human beings or to oneself. The uh, protection of life is uppermost in everybody's instinctive reactions. But here, the public were being prevented from intervening in what was obviously a murder. I don't think we... uh, The question of a trial, I mean, is immaterial. It was... I think everybody agrees worldwide that... George Floyd was murdered in broad daylight, in full view of other human beings. And I thought to myself, how is it possible for them to have done that to a fellow American? Then I realized that it speaks volumes of the levels of indoctrination to which people like this have been subject for a very long time. uh, Racism, of course, was invented as the justification for slavery and colonialism. Dehumanize people which then makes it in order to do to them what you have done. We all know the colonial history, we also know the history of slavery. And it's not a very glorious part of human history, the depth to which we can descend. And the problem is that it is the system that requires racism. And it also, for the exploitation of human beings, you have to dehumanise them this way. And you probably know of the American teacher, Jane Elliott, who did this little experiment in the United States about 50 years ago, separating the kids in the classroom with the blue-eyed ones and the brown-eyed ones and uh, giving the blue-eyed ones the impression one t- at one time that they were superior to the others. And then you see the reaction. And then, of course, you turn the thing around. And that taught a very valuable lesson to young people. And as she rightly points out, nobody is born with a genetic disposition to racism and that it is taught. And anything that is taught, we can unlearn. So the reaction to George Floyd's murder was instant and global. I think every decent human being the world over felt the same revulsion and also realised that there's never been any justice in cases like this. We mustn't forget that it took a very long time for anybody to be arrested, even though it was a clear-cut case of murder. And the authorities were very slow to react. But throughout the world, people went out on the streets, despite the lockdown, to protest this grotesque murder. And it wasn't just black people protesting, it was everybody. There's been an awakening of sorts during this pandemic. People have begun to see the system for what it is. It brutalises everybody, it exploits everybody in the interests of a small sector of of human society. I think everybody suggests that when one talks about the class struggle, that it is a fiction. But it is terribly clear that there's an elite the superclass who control society in their interests at the expense of everybody else. And George Floyd is just another victim in this struggle. And I was pleased to see that everybody around the world decided to take action. It's only by collective action as human beings, you know, the question of solidarity. We talk about solidarity, but we seldom practice it because the system tries to separate us from each other. Look, during lockdown, everybody's been sitting in their own living rooms, watching television, doing whatever they do but disconnected from every other human being. And that, of course, is problematic because, as a species, we are fundamentally a social being. And it is our interaction with others that makes our own lives meaningful. But despite this isolation, everybody 
around the world decided that they needed to do something. And the reaction of the state has always been very vicious. I, mean, I don't know whether you noticed this, but it was interesting for me to realize that in the United States, for example, the United States government had been, at that point, incapable of providing medical equipment or protective equipment for their medical staff dealing with a pandemic. But within seconds of the protests going on the streets, they had at their disposal the most sophisticated machinery of oppression. Police vehicles, tear gas, rubber bullets, you name it. And this tells you something about the state. The state is far more interested in controlling the human population than preserving life. Much of the same happened in the United Kingdom, where the spontaneous protests were denounced, really quite viciously denounced. And it is always the same thing they try to do. They try to tarnish legitimate pro protest with the accusations of violence. But if you look at the historical record, we'll realize that the state inserts provocateurs into the crowds in order to foment the kind of violence which they can then use as a weapon to wipe away legitimate pro protest. But it hasn't worked. You will also know that in Britain, statues are being, are being torn down. And this, for me, is a, a useful indication that the population is no longer allowing itself to be controlled in the way that it thinks also. It begins to see the connection between the death of George Floyd and slavery and colonialism and all these statues around first world countries, the imperial countries, and the role that that played in the exploitation of, the, of other human beings across the planet. And they will no longer stand for this. There's this idea that tearing down a statue erases history, but of course this is bunkum. I think that in the United Kingdom, people learned more about British colonial history with the tearing down of the statue of Colston than they'd learned in the last hundred years. So I'm optimistic about the future. As somebody with a dark skin, a black person, I've never been immune from racism. It has always been deemed to be my problem because in the music business, as you know, it is fundamentally white. When I, as I grew up in South Africa, it was 99.9% .9 white. And in Britain, of course, it's not much different. It's maybe 98%, something in that order. I, I haven't got exact figures to hand, but so there's fundamentally, fundamentally no difference. But the other important thing that I learned very early on in life was that actually racism was exported around the world by the British. For example, the country in which I was born, South Africa, was a colony, a British colony. And the racism that continued in a formalized way in South Africa was set up by the British. And that, when I arrived in Britain, I was expecting something completely different, a society in which racism was not an issue. But I was soon disabused of that view. But just to return for a moment to George Floyd. George Floyd is just, again, one of many people that have been murdered by the state and without consequences for the perpetrators. You will probably know that one of the perpetrators uh, is free on bail of $750,000, apparently, according to the media. And one has to ask the question, who has paid three quarters of a million pounds of bail for this man? Is it right that somebody that is accused of such a heinous crime should be out on the streets? And then you have to ask that if he's out on the streets, you probably saw the video on YouTube of him being confronted in the supermarket. Then you have to ask, who is it that is funding this agenda to protect police officers who, on behalf of the state, perpetrate these crimes? This has always been the case, that uh, police officers are protected. They are the thugs of the state. The state has the, the monopoly on violence. Don't forget that if we withdraw our support for the system, it collapses. And the state, the only way it can coerce us into doing what it wants is through violence. Physical violence, economic violence and social violence. And the violence of course comes in many forms. We have to understand what it is they, that they do to us. But I think that this period through which we're living, difficult period for everybody, has within it the seeds of a human revolution, an awakening and a better understanding.